Hi there, and welcome to an update on the way in which game theory can be used in your A-level economics as revision for the 2018 exams. Let's kick off with a quick true and false quiz. Have we got these four questions that relate to, in particular, the operation of competition policy in the UK, which is going to be a focus of our aspects of game theory in this session. So true or false, it can be illegal to attend a meeting with employees from other businesses where price is discussed. What do you think? True or false? And the answer to this question is true. Sharing information about price, any discussion between competitive firms over price can be deemed to be illegal under EU and UK competition law. Question number two. As a customer, it's OK to tell suppliers the prices that other suppliers are quoting you. What do you reckon? The answer to question two is true. It's OK. In fact, that's part of the normal competitive process. If you're given a quote, for example, from a builder or a car insurance company, it's OK to tell the other firms what you're being quoted. It's part of the competitive process. Statement three, businesses can agree not to sell to the same customers as each other. What do you think for question three? Well, statement three is false. Businesses cannot agree to share the market. That is a form of collusion and is illegal under EU and UK competition law. And finally, statement number four. Admitting your involvement in a cartel can lead to immunity from penalties. What do we think for statement number four? And the answer is true. In fact, this is the whistleblowing effect. Oftentimes, competition authorities are prepared to offer leniency to those people who are willing to blow the whistle on a price-fixing or market-sharing cartel. Now, the reason for going through those four statements is it brings us into the area of game theory, and in particular, the interdependent nature of decision-making, especially in oligopolistic industries. But game theory, as I'm sure you know, if you've covered it as part of your AWE economics, has many, many applications, some of which are highly topical. We'll talk at the end of this session about the trade war between China and the States, and in particular, Donald Trump's view that uh, winning a trade war is pretty easy. We win big, it's easy, discuss. But increasingly, of course, game theory can be applied to auctions, for example, the auctions of the new uh, bandwidth licenses for 5G. The whole question about how to price uh, the pharmaceuticals that uh, big pharmaceutical companies sell to the NHS, the attempts to fix or influence the price of oil globally by OPEC, the, the world's biggest uh, cartel in terms of oil supply. And occasionally we get in the news um, situations where the Competition and Markets Authority, the CMA, has made a decision, having done a market investigation, which leads to some penalty for firms found guilty of price fixing, or in this case, two laundry companies agreeing not to compete for each other's customers. That's an example of market sharing, and they suffered a fine. The classic prisoner's dilemma game is uh, a really good way of introducing the idea of game theory. In this, this case, we're going to take a look at two firms that uh, can either set a high price or a low price in the market, and the expected payoff is shown in the table in terms of billions of dollars. Now, crucially, the classic prisoner's dilemma game shown here uh, illustrates why two completely rational individuals might not cooperate, even if it appears that it's in their best interest to do so. So setting a high price, a high price equilibrium, could lead to a total profit of £6 billion pounds if they both charge a high price. But the dominant strategy in this game is actually to charge a low price. It's the means by which you're likely to get the potential of getting £5 billion pounds worth of profit and uh, guaranteed at least $1 billion. Whereas, of course, if you set a low price, well, if you set a low, a high price and somebody else sets a low price, then you'll end up with no profit and the rival firm ends up with $5 billion. So this is the high price cooperation through price fixing or collusion, which leads to joint profit maximisation of £6 billion. And this is where both firms think it's rational for not to cooperate on price, to engage in vigorous price competition. You end up with joint profits uh, £4 billion lower. Here's another example from a past exam question where you have two firms, again, charging a high price, £20, or a low price, £10. The collusive equilibrium, if both firms charge £20, the joint profits are £24 million, whereas if they compete vigorously at low prices, you end up in the bottom right-hand section of this matrix table, showing total profits dropping to just £4 million.
Now, what are the implications? What are the implications of the prisoner's dilemma game, in particular for the conduct of businesses that we see in imperfect competition? Well, crucially, whenever you're talking about game theory in an exam, the key idea to use, the really important idea to put in an answer, is the idea that the behaviour of firms, the decisions they take over price, over advertising, over, over research and development, over investment, the decisions, the choices they make are interdependent. Let me reiterate that word, it's so important, interdependent. The decisions that firm A takes are influenced by what they think firm B will take or another rival firm in the market. Oftentimes, uh, game theory suggests that firms may settle on an equilibrium where prices are relatively sticky and they tend to keep their, their prices fairly stable, even perhaps when there's a change in costs. Alternatively, you might see an emergence in the market of a price leader. So maybe a dominant firm in the market who sets basically the, uh, the level of price and signals a change in the market price for a standardised product. Game theory also suggests, of course, there is the ever-present possibility and the potential return from some form of collusive behaviour. So it could be that firms agree to fix the price at a high level, price-fixing cartel, or it, it could be, although illegal, that they agree to share the market in some shape or form. Another aspect that comes from the prisoner's dilemma model is if they're not competing on price, how do you gain market share? Well, you really focus on non-price competition. We'll have a look at that in a second. And there may also be some advantages, depending on the type of game we're playing, from being first into the market. So we think about the potential advantages, as well as the disadvantages or the drawbacks, from being a first mover into a particular market or into a particular industry sector. So crucially, in oligopoly, non-price competition becomes hugely important in terms of determining the, the market share that firms are able to get. So be it innovation in programming by Netflix, the quality of service from businesses like Waitrose, for example, after sales service, Dropbox offering free upgrades to products, computer games companies like PlayStation offering exclusivity or loyalty schemes. The whole issue of branding and advertising becomes crucial, as does other little other tricks of the trade, including behavioural nudges to get you to buy more. The power of the word free, for example, applied to shipping of goods and services is particularly good example. Uh, branding, product branding is absolutely essential when it comes to understanding game theoretic behaviour in markets. Oftentimes firms spend huge amounts on branding their products and marketing their goods and services because if they don't and other firms do, then they stand to lose market share. So we go from the, the generic product brand, a brand associated with a specific product such as pot noodles, all the way through to service brands, umbrella brands, own label brands and truly global brands such as Ikea and McDonald's. So branding is really significant. I mentioned a few seconds ago the importance of first mover advantage. This is a, an idea which is now on the syllabus of some examples. So first mover is basically being the potential advantages of being essentially the first firm to break into a particular market. They can develop a competitive advantage, for example, by learning from doing, by actually making the product or the goods and services, making mistakes along the way, but increasing their experience and as a result being able to reduce costs. Firms that experience learning by doing can make it more expensive, more difficult uh, for new firms and rivals to enter. And in particular, of course, if you're first in the market and successful, you can exploit internal economies of scale, leading to a fall in average cost in the long term. First movers can also generate that brand loyalty, which makes it easier to, to sell uh, to customers once over. The marketing costs of selling to a new customer can be three, four, five times more than the marketing costs of selling something to an existing customer. And if you're interested in behavioural economics, of course, you'll know that behaviour choices we make can become habitual. Our default decisions, uh, the choices we make in markets without really thinking, are quite hard to eat into. So potentially, firms that are first into the market have a first mover advantage. However, it's important to be able to evaluate this. There can also be some disadvantages from being an early entrant into a sector. So, for example, employees from the first mover firm may leave, oftentimes they do, to set up perhaps a challenger brand, taking with them their own human capital and some of the intellectual capital of the business. 
the failure rate of first movers into the market is often very high. So that can leave an opening for new firms to come and uh, take take their place. Indeed, second movers can often learn much from watching first mover mistakes. Dropbox, for example, was not the first file sharing app in the world. It was probably something like 30th or 35th in the market. Perhaps it's important, instead of just being first into the market, first scale advantage might be more important than first mover. Get to scale, bring your unit cost down, that gives you a significant competitive gain over a rival firm. Let's have a quick look at one or two exam style questions on game theory. So here's question one. We can have a go at these. Press the pause button when you want to have a look at the answer or take a look at the question before the answer comes. So question one, an industry consists of two firms X and Y. The profit payoff matrix is shown in the table. Until recently, firms have colluded with a view to maximising their joint profits. What will be the decline in their joint profits if mutual distrust leads both firms to start acting competitively? Press the pause button, have a go at this question, and press play when you want to go through the answer. So recently, firms have been colluding. That means they've been setting a high price. They've been top left, both setting a price of £10, making £12 million of profits. The question is, what would be the decline in their joint profits if mutual distrust causes them to start acting competitively? Well, they're going to end up on the bottom, bottom right in the table. They've both been setting a low price of £5. That means they make no profit each. Therefore, the loss of profits is equal to £12 million. Answer D. Question two is a general knowledge question. Have a go at this one. How much can businesses be fined for breaking UK competition law? Is it up to a million pounds? Up to 10 million pounds? Up to two years worth of profit? Up to 10% of global annual turnover? What do you think for question two? Press the pause button, have a think. Press play when you want to check the answer. Well, under UK competition law, Firms that are found guilty of price fixing, for example, and market sharing or under other forms of collusive cartel behaviour, which we can model in game theory, they can be fined D, up to 10% of their global annual turnover. Of course, co companies that blow the whistle on collusion stand to get a much more lenient penalty. Another game theory question to have a go at. The following matrix shows the possible revenue conditions, pounds per day, for two firms tendering for contracts to supply training programmes to local authorities. Assuming two firms have agreed a price that will give each a revenue of £1,000 per contract, what subsequent actions would lead to a revenue of just £800 per contract? Press the pause button, and uh, when you're ready, press, press play, we'll crack on. OK, correct answer here is... C, collusion is broken down. So instead of setting a high price for these training contracts uh, that with a collusive agreement, so collusion is in the lowest top left of a game theory matrix, they start vigorously competing with each other to win those contracts. Their profits come down as a result. Question four, similar question. Following matrix shows the possible profit outcomes of two firms selling breakfast cereal. Wow. Initially, they set they collude to set a high price. However, Bensel has just decided to break this agreement and undercut the price. Which one of the following is the most likely consequence of this? What will Harker do? Have a go at question number four. OK, what do you think for question four, this past, this past paper question? The answer is B, Harker will lower its price. It has to, given what uh, Bensel has decided to do. And both firms will make lower profits as a result. Question five, game theory can be used to illustrate which of the following examples of competitive behaviour. Have a go, it's either A, B, C or D. Okay, what do we think here? Game theory can be used to illustrate which example of competitive behaviour. The answer is B, tacit collusion oligopoly. Tacit collusion is where firms, instead of explicitly trying to fix the price, essentially operate a kind of silent collusion. So, for example, uh, they might agree never to undercut each other. Um, sometimes the price leadership model, for example, a tacit form of collusion. Firms might say, if you can find the same product cheaper within seven days, we'll refund the difference, a form of tacit collusion. Just finally, uh, let's think about how we can apply game theory on the macro side. So most applications of game theory you'd be writing about in your exam would be micro, 
oligopoly, for example. But increasingly, we can use game theory in a macro context. And the most recent example is the trade war, or trade wars that seem to be emerging between the United States and a number of countries. The context, I suppose, internationally is that actually average import tariffs globally are pretty low. They're just 2% in advanced countries. They're higher, they're closer to 9% in emerging countries. So tariffs have come down in recent times. And basically, there's a the choice that you can make when you're engaging in trade. The rules basically go like this. You can either cooperate to engage in cooperative behaviour with other countries, essentially allowing the free flow of goods and services into your country. Or, and, and doing so, you recognise there are some gains from specialisation and trade based on comparative advantage, although there may be some winners and some losers. Or, alternatively, you can adopt a defective approach. You can impose a, a significant tariff or maybe a quota on foreign goods. Now, because you trade as a country time and time again, uh, you have to think about the strategy in trade that you're going to you're going to follow. Are you basically a country which is in favour of free trade, or a country that believes more in interventionism, perhaps using the idea of, of uh, tariffs and quotas as a form of protectionism? But you have to think about the likely response of other countries uh, who are in the in the in the game in that sense. Here's a simple prisoner's dilemma table we could create if you want to, if you're doing a question on trade theory of protectionism. So this is a kind of payoff, I don't know, in terms of billions of dollars of whatever it is, revenue, GDP. It's actually in, in each country's interest to adopt a defective approach because that, that way they can get 25, minimum of 10. Uh, if they both effectively end up with 10 each, and of course, if that's the case, they'd be better off cooperating and earning 15 each. But there's no guarantee that that cooperation will last. So the payoff structure in this model suggests a defective strategy might be, repeat, might be in each country's best interests. But international trade is a repeated game. It's played every day, every week, every month, every year. It's not a one-off shot game. And so if you're playing a game many times over, there is the chance for cooperative strategies to emerge. In other words, countries may make free trade agreements. Uh, we have to think about the gains and losses, oftentimes not just in now economic terms, but also in terms of social gains and increasingly, of course, in geopolitical terms. So please do follow the whole debate about what's happening with trade wars and things. Uh, the OECD and the IMF warning of tit for tat as a form of strategy in this particular game. Let's see what happens, whether we get a full-scale trade war emerging or whether perhaps wiser counsel prevails and countries recognise the mutual gains from trade in goods and services. Either way, uh, lots of ways in which you can use your game theory in economics. We've been through the prisoner's dilemmas revision. We've been through a bit of UK competition policy as well. So thanks for joining in this revision webinar on game theory.